How are you going? This is Luke from uh, Support Act, and thanks for joining us on another episode of Soundcheck. Uh, for anyone who's experiencing any issues with their mental health or their well-being in general, uh, also including any financial issues you might be encountering, we encourage you to call the Support Act Wellbeing Helpline on 1-800-959-500. Today, I am joined by Patrick Donovan, who is the CEO of Music Victoria, the former chair of the Australian Music Industry Network and lead singer of Cows Muff. Thanks for joining us, Patrick. Good to be here, Luke. So you've, you've been a bit of a jack of all trades in your career. I've read your uh, bio. So you've done some tour management. You've been a journo. Uh, and a, obviously, in the last few years, a music industry spokesperson and advocate. The first question I've got for you is, uh, what's on the horizon for Cows Muff? Oh, crikey. Well, um... Everyone's at home, working from home, listening to radio at the moment. So um, we split up about uh, six months ago and a um, song got played on the radio yesterday and I got a lot of inquiries. So I said to the band, let's finish that video and get it out. So I'm interested in um, seeing what comes out of the singer-songwriters, including myself, um, how I react to this. My initial reaction is rage. And I'm a cage tiger and I uh, sing in a punk band and I... I wouldn't mind getting out there and having a bit of a uh, bit of a scream, but um, no. we're a part-time band. I wouldn't want to be taking up any uh, any spots of more serious bands. But um, uh, who knows? We'll see. We'll see how we go. We'll, we'll finish the video for starters and uh, see how we go. But um, certainly, uh, I look at this as an opportunity for um, Australian acts uh, to have first crack at the uh, rooms and the festivals and it could be a amazing opportunity. So if we can support our artists through this period, then, um, and there's a number of grants going around at the moment, not just the job keeper to survive, but to actually get paid for their art, then um, I think there's going to be a uh, incredible uh, era for, uh, for Australian music. Yeah. I, and I feel you as well. Like I'm in a band as well. There's 12 of us and it's like our little social network. You know, we, we've been going through this period of, rehearsing and writing hard and we just came off a bit of a festival circuit last year and we were due to do a single launch and then this all kicked in just the week before we were due to release a new single at the night cat here in melbourne and then it was all done but uh, i know that we've been we've been doing some videos online and all that kind of thing i'm absolutely i haven't been more itching to play music in my life <laughs> i think a lot of people are delaying their releases but i actually think it's probably a good time yeah uh, to be releasing music and just delaying the uh the tour and the launch. Um, clear schedule, so, perhaps. Yeah, but certainly a lot of um, grants, particularly council grants at the moment, they're going around uh, for new works. So um, they're sort of encouraging people to write about how they're feeling at the moment. And obviously that's uh, something that helps, uh, you know, not only the individual artists deal with what they're going through, but uh, connects uh, those emotions to everyone else, all the listeners. So, um, yeah, I think it's going to be very interesting to see what art comes out of this. And, of course, some of the greatest art has come out of dire circumstances so um i'm not assuming that everyone's got lots of time at home to be uh writing masterpieces but certainly uh the angrier uh punk rock that's uh come out over the decades um some of the best music and fieriest music and most important songs have come out from times like this so uh patrick probably um good to give us an idea of your career up to this point i gave a few of the highlights but What's, what's been your role in the music industry and your involvement in the industry in your career? Oh, well, um, I suppose when I was at the Age newspaper, I uh, wrote about um, all music, but I had a particular fondness for local music. And I had a column called Sticky Carpet, which is still uh, being written to, to this day by Marty Bolton. And um, I really focused on the local scene and wrote about things I was hearing and seeing on the weekends and... Um, I was a strong advocate for Victorian and Australian music, even though I was writing about international music as well. I thought a lot of the international music was um, overhyped. And uh, I also... Much more, it already. Yeah. It was almost like before the artists had been launched in Australia, it was just assumed because of these huge marketing budgets of the major labels that they would be accepted and loved here. And quite often I said, no, no I don't like it. Rubbish. I don't <laughs> like it. <laughs> but, um, so I really Power focused of the on, critic, Patrick. <laughs> yeah, I really focused on our local scene. Um, and I loved uh, being able to get to know musicians and I loved seeing music in small venues and requesting a song for uh, in return for a uh, 
pack of chips or a, uh, a beer or something uh, for the artists. So I started the um, AGG Awards, which was celebrating our local music. And that's uh, running to this day under the form of uh, the Music Victoria Awards. Um, and we've partnered with uh, Support Act as the charity over the years and raised about $50,000 for Support Act. Um, and I also had a column called Sticky Carpet and wrote, wrote about local news. And then I, um, I started the campaign for ACDC Lane. Um, essentially, I was sick of uh, massive ticker tape parades for our artists and statues uh, uh, commemorating um, tennis players and thought that the same should happen to musicians. So that sort of got the ball rolling for ACDC Lane, which set the precedent for um, a couple of other music laneways, which has been great. So um, now I was kind of part of the, you know, visit Victoria kind of tourism stuff as well. Yeah. So I suppose if I think about the similarities between my jobs, um, I cared and advocated for the local scene. And I also tried to um, understand the more uh, complex issues around planning and liquor licensing and all of those types of things. So uh, at the paper, I sort of wrote entertainment, but I also wrote hard news pieces and, um, and understood some of the big issues, particularly around the time of the Slam Rally, which um, helped me uh, sort of get my head around these very complex uh, uh, l- uh, reforms and uh, legislation across liquor licensing and planning and um, um, the EPA and noise regulations. And um, yeah, so uh, there's so many facets to the music industry and um, it was great to sort of, uh, I really enjoy sort of getting delving deep in those areas and um you know there's always something that we're fighting for um in fact you know i just said to you a bit earlier you know like we're sort of in an element a peak body um when there is a crisis we just don't expect um you know 70 percent of the industry to be in crisis at once it's a bit hard to uh, deal no. with uh, all of those things at once but um we're trying to sort of split it up between our staff and um and really focus on what those areas are so um the biggest areas of need so uh, we've been having uh weekly working groups with all the different sectors with artists with venue owners venue bookers booking agents that start one with festivals and we listen we listen to what they're going through and then we take out their key points and then over the next week we go and um lobby and write letters to ministers and uh, insurance companies and the like. And, uh, and then, you know, I suppose each week when I reconnect with, um, you know, I'm personally working on the live music venue owners um, group every week. We just want to give them something, um, a bit of hope um, because at this stage, we're still in the crisis stage, which are all about saving lives and saving businesses. And um, if uh, people can just have a bit of hope that, um, that there is some support coming and the state and federal government have been pretty supportive on the whole and, and the councils, um, then it just helps people sort of get through this. And hopefully, you know, when we look at uh, the, the ground zero, the disaster, I, I can't remember what day it was, but uh, when it all started falling apart, you know, hopefully that'll be the worst day and uh, it just gets, you know, slowly better uh, from here. And, you know, there's, as we move into stage two, which is around the recovery, you know, we're starting to look at opportunities um, about uh, how we can come out of this um, even better. Absolutely. Before I let you go on any further, like you already beat me to it, but uh, I know as a staff member of Support Act that we're, you know, incredibly thankful to you as an advocate in the industry and also obviously Music Victoria and the fantastic work Music Vic has done for the last 10 years and advocating so, so passionately for the industry consistently, like an, in, an organisation that came out of, you know, something as shit as like the slam rallies and that fight back against that situation, then jumping straight into action this time around, like and as, you know, part of the Sound of Silence campaign, which we'll come on to speak about a little bit more, um, you know, just want to say thanks on behalf of Support Act and, you know, all the people who will be recipients of our crisis relief funding you know for the hard work of yourself and music victoria well thanks luke and um you know we there couldn't have been a better time for support act to have been um well resourced Mm. and i was so glad to have you um in the melbourne office in the victorian office and um so we uh because it was all sort of run out of sydney for a while so um to have the helpline to have you working in victoria with all your experience in mental health then as a practicing musician is so important and i suppose um i'll also share that we uh we have the same chair uh sally howland chair of support act chair of music victoria so i think that says a lot about our um similarities in terms of what's important for us we're on the same page which is great so just going back to the day one, which I also can't identify all <laughs> in my head is that I was meant to be working backstage at Download doing some well-being stuff. 
And then the next thing I know, I got a phone call saying, I'm sorry, it's not happening. Downloads done. What was that first week like for you at Music Victoria as it was all unfolding? And, and what were your instincts and the first things that you undertook to respond? Wow. Yeah. I mean, when we do come up to rare, it'd be interesting to look back. You have to think, diary. think about it. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, I, I look back to um, first when we celebrated the 10th anniversary of the Slam Rally. We just had a, there was a small get together that um, Helen and Quincy from Bakehouse put on for people who are involved in the um, campaign 10 years ago. We had a small uh, meal at the Railway Hotel in North Carlton, which is a family owned pub with a bluegrass band. Um, Rick Dempster's band was playing and they were the first band that got um, pulled off stage 10 years ago uh, because liquor licensing were demanding that they had uh, two security guards. So we had a very quiet little celebration there and we, it, was, it, was, it was about the small stuff. We were really celebrating the fact that the Brunswick Blue Shooters were still playing and you could still buy a beautiful home-cooked Palma in a little pub. And, um, and it wasn't about 10,000 people and uh, you know, uh, ACDC on the back of a truck. It was, it was a quiet, sobering, um, beautiful uh, moment where we celebrated 10 years. Um, and then we were coming up to the 10th anniversary of Music Victoria um, uh, a month later. And then I remember starting to call around and just starting to hear about the impact on, um, on, on particularly artists. This is before venues closed. And then we immediately pulled our membership drive. Um, and then uh, it was essentially the first role was to try and decipher the information and share it with the, with the sector. So... Um, certainly in terms of live music venues, it was very difficult because um, there was a state government briefing, which was the day of the Grand Prix, mid-March, uh, and they didn't give a lot of instructions around um, uh, what the restrictions would be, what might come next. Um, and it was very difficult for the venues and promoters to actually, they were about to be booking in tours for the next six months. It's going to cost them a lot of money, and I think they really wanted some direction. Um, and it wasn't forthcoming that day. Uh, I raced back to the office and started writing up, uh, you know, the latest information that I had to share with um, our members. And uh, as I was about to press send, um, Scott Morrison, the pr Prime Minister, announced the 500 um, capacity limit. And so I thought, well, we've got somebody to work with here. At least we can go out and say it's 500. 90% of our venues are under 500 capacity. And... Um, we, uh, you know, at least had some direction there. That social distancing, 500 capacity, let's work with this. It's something that we can work with. Um, I remember, and then it, just to interrupt you there, I remember thinking that time, like our gig that we were meant to do was a 500 capacity and I was starting to freak out. I was like, oh, that's good. Like if there's some, if they're reducing numbers, it takes the pressure off us a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> that was the silver yeah, lining of that situation. <laughs> yeah, we could have, could have sold out a thousand, but you know. Uh, oh, of course, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was the government's fault. <laughs> So, um, so we started trying to work with that, uh, with the 500 capacity um, and the social distancing and what that will mean. And we were speaking to larger venues about some strategies around, um, say, Amel and the Sniffers doing two 500 capacity shows in a 1,000 capacity venue. Yep. Um, and um, then a lot of confusion. Uh, and every day uh, the rules change. So it was very important that we got the information that came to hand out as quickly as possible. Then there became a difficult situation of um, venues that were allowed to operate started getting um, shamed um, online for being open. And that was a very difficult situation um, because um, that's fine for some people who didn't need to work or could close their business. A lot of these venues couldn't afford to do that. So they needed to reinvent their model. And so we needed to be supporting the ones that chose to do that um, as long as the, the health advice was saying that they could operate. Um, within a couple of days, it was all shut down. Um, and that's when we started having these um, weekly meetings. And I'll never forget the first venue owner meetings and every venue thought they were going to go under. And just, you know, to think that we were just celebrating having, you know, the largest number of venues in a city in the world. Yeah. You know, the amount of toil that has gone um, into, into that through the venue owners, the musicians or the staff, you know, um, the advocates, uh, the government supporting, you know, lots of legislative reform over the years. To think that that could all disappear overnight was just the most sickening feeling. I remember I was meant to attend a, a meeting with Music Victoria for City of Melbourne venue uh, venue owners, and that was one of the first things out of my calendar that got canceled. <clears throat> so, yeah. yeah, yeah, we had a City of Yarra venues meeting a month earlier, and um, 
uh, we talked about all the issues that everyone was facing and the EPA and the, uh, the noise regulations, which were about to be finalised, all sorts of issues. And then um, John Pering, owner of the Tote Bar Open, just casually and quietly said at the end of the meeting, uh, when I asked if there's any other questions, he said, oh, what about this um, elephant in the room, um, this, uh, this virus? And uh, no one had even thought of it. Mm. Um, and that was like a month before it all went down the gurgler. So um, that was just incredible how quickly it happened. But I suppose from those conversations of thinking, of the venue owners thinking, having so many, uh, you know, they're just being attacked from all sides. And each week I spoke to that, that group, there was something else that came through. So they're worried about their staff, which is a beautiful thing. And then job keeper, job seeker came through. Okay, all right, well, like, the staff might be okay. Okay, well, now we've got to worry about liquor licensing. We wrote to liquor licensing and they uh, not only um, waived the fees for six months or, or said they'll refund them, but they'll do it for 12 months. Great. Okay, well, we've halted that. Then we uh, kept on passing on the message that uh, the rent was the biggest issue and then the rent um, uh, code of conduct was announced by uh, the Prime Minister and um, any day now we expect that to be legislated in Victoria, which will hopefully um, have the rent uh, for six months and then the second half can be uh, paid off over a couple of years. Then some loans were announced. Then there was a $10,000 grant from small businesses, uh, small business fund. and. Um, and so each week we were sort of taking the major issues and advocating to government uh, that those were the biggest issues and whether we contributed to some of those changes or not, who knows, who cares. Uh, we certainly felt, and I think the venues felt like um, that the venues issues were being listened to and we have some good communication lines with state government in particular. And um, it sort of got to the stage where each week there was something else that was supporting them. We've got to the stage now, just while, just to finish off on the venues, um, where we've um, seen a couple of venues go on the market. Um, it's become clear that um, the uh, packages won't um, uh, necessarily keep venues afloat. So I'm just putting the final touches on a pr proposal that will go to the state government and hopefully the federal government next week, which um, clearly outlines, based on our data from the um, a great survey that the Live Music Office uh, put together and partnered with Amen which um, asked them specific questions about their costs. And so we can now go to the government and say specifically, uh, these costs have gone, these costs have been reduced, these fixed outgoings are still there and the venues can't afford to pay them. So um, we can now go, now we have the data, which is very, very important. We can now say there's 700 venues in Victoria with live music and this is how much it's gonna cost them to stay open for six months and not go under. Um, and then we might need um, uh, some support in four months time because it, everything's pointing to um, uh, venues um, being able to gradually reopen. And we're sort of assuming that it'll start with, you know, a 25% capacity, um, build up to maybe under 500 and then um, eventually be, be uh, back, to, back to normal. But that's just back to normal in terms of, you know, uh, capacity. There won't be any. Long way off. Yeah, there won't be any international acts. Um, and even um, getting back to full capacity could be some time off in the future. Yeah. Yeah. So we need to plan for that. So um, certainly, uh, once the venues reopen, the artists will be ready to go. That yep. the local artists, great opportunity for local artists. Yep. Um, but then we've got to get that the um, the the fans back out again. I mean, in Wuhan, the restaurants are open, but no one's going out. So. Um, Essentially, there'll be a big, big campaign around um, uh, public support um, and the public getting back out there and, and supporting music. And there's also some good campaigns like the Australian Made campaign um, and a few other campaigns around um, increasing quotas and Australian Music Days. And, you know, it's one thing for Australia's artists to create um, uh, some great music over the next few months, but we, we need the streaming companies and um, radio and TV to be playing it um, so we can get those Australian acts um, right at the top of people's um, uh, minds. Yeah, like you said, there's been there's been a number of pretty fantastic campaigns come around through this time. But just zoning in quickly on a couple of the, the bigger ones, I lost my gig, which was put out by uh, AIM and, and also the Australian Festivals Association, and then uh, Sound of Silence. Maybe you want to talk about your involvement in those two a little bit. Yeah, um, uh, the I Lost My Gig was the brainchild of Emily Collins, New South Wales CEO, uh, and Julia from the Australian Festivals Association. Um, so, you know, when we look back on how quickly people people um, acted, the, they, they were quick. They they said, right, and they just asked for approval from 
their boards and we all said, great, let's get it up and going. Right. And, yeah. and we're always, with all of these um, uh, campaigns and initiatives, you know, we'd like to spend more time on them, but then you've got to get them out as well. So you can't do any lobbying until you've got the data. So that was a great initiative. And um, so the numbers just kept on growing and growing and growing. So um, we did a lot of media in those early days and, um, and to be able to quote the figure of how many gigs were lost and how many jobs were lost um, in all of those early interviews, it just put uh, the live music sector right up the top. Um, yeah, you know, unfortunately, right up the top, along with international travel and tourism and um, international education um, as the hardest hit. Um, and that was really, really important. So um, that just kept on growing and, you know, difficult for, um, you know, uh, for Em and Julia setting up that because it suddenly became sort of this massive project on its own. Uh, once that sort of simmered down a bit, um, we needed to get some more granular data. So that's when um, John Wardle from the Live Music Office um, had a survey ready to go and we worked on and Eamon worked on that with him um, to actually get the granular data that each of the states and um, and, and federally as well that we can um, put those figures to the state government so that those both those surveys are really important but of course you know the venue owners and artists are going through turmoil they've got a lot of admin trying to get some government support and job keeper job seeker and the like apply for grants so we have to be very careful about surveying them uh, too much and also it was quite harrowing for some of the venues yeah and it was harrowing for people to fill out those surveys to yeah. see in front of them what they're losing um, yeah the sound of silence campaign was brilliant one really great thing that's come out of this crisis is how closely and united the industry has been working together and I, I suppose I'd like to say to all the musicians and venues and industry out there that um, that you know the uh, associations and peak bodies um, have been working really hard and really well together um, so uh, a bunch of um, you know the first teleconference was set up by Nick Picard from um, from uh, APRA at Rampacos um, he chaired a meeting with 50 people on Zoom and I didn't think it could happen and he nailed it. Um, he nailed had a good it. agenda. <laughs> had a good agenda and he nailed it. And I said, all right, I can do it. I can do it. So thanks, Nick. Yeah. Uh, but in that Probably meeting... We're experts now. <laughs> yeah. I'd barely even heard of it before this. Sorry? I'd barely even heard of it before this and now I feel like <laughs> I'm on it all day, every day. <laughs> um, so we all sort of split up into groups and um, I was involved in um, coordinating the uh, national campaign group and um, Maggie Collins from Big Sound uh, was chair of that. And we had some amazing people on that group. And it was like we were all working for the same company. Yeah, it, it felt like, like that. Everyone was just basically uh, on board and we're all working together and everyone's, you know, um, putting their hand up for um, different aspects of the campaign. And so the idea there was, okay, well, we can go to government and we need to develop, you know, the build the case there and, and present the data. But we also need to get out there and... Um, let the public know how they can continue to support their music community and um so that campaign was developed and um some amazing minds at um uh, Ticketmaster and um uh, jackie atlas and um and and triple j and then the campaign was designed around the sound of silence which will happen if uh we don't get any support for our artists there'll be silence and um some um, and and uh, maddie rogers from unified donating all his t-shirts so we had merch um, and it was basically a campaign. Dove Newton did the ads uh, from the Bushwhackers, mm -hmm. the voiceover, which was great. Yeah. One for one for community radio, one for uh, commercial radio, yeah. and um, and that went out within about ten days. It was launched. It was absolutely incredible. It was yeah. you know it was a serious campaign, and that was around. Um, and and then a lot of artists did some videos, and the website was set up in terms of encouraging the public largely uh, to continue to support their music, uh, their favorite musicians. So, and, and asking people to donate to support act. So um, it was very I certainly, important. I certainly felt through that, that, you know, like support act was one of going to be one of the beneficiaries of that campaign. But for us looking internally, you know, we we were seeing a, a level of inquiry for crisis relief that we'd never seen before. You know, I'm only relatively new, but going by what staff had been there for 20 years was saying, oh, we've never seen anything like this, incredible numbers. And as a small organisation going, well, what are we going to do? Like, how are we possibly ever going to respond? It's, we're not an insurance company. We're not the government. We're not a bank. How mm. are we going to do it? But to feel that support of the industry and, um, you know, the amazing advocacy of yourself and the heaps of other incredible, you know, people within the industry putting their full weight behind it. And for us to realise, like, well, they're genu you know, genuinely, this is a push to fundraise for us and to see the response uh, in the fundraising has been 
uh, incredible at a time where we feel like so many people were completely fatigued to fundraising. Um, showed that you know people still did care about uh, Australian music, but not just that. Like in terms of the name recognition that Support Act achieved through that campaign, the lightning rod we became for the industry. You know, obviously it hasn't fully met the expectations of the industry in terms of what the federal government would come forward with, but certainly has helped Support Act to respond to that huge level of crisis with the funding we've just received recently. Yeah, no, it's been great. And, um, you know, what timing for you guys to be fully functional. Um, but it's very important that the industry got together quickly and said, right, let's not have 100 campaigns. Um, there were some great um, GoFundMe campaigns that raised some money, but, um, you know, I've seen it. Um, I've seen people um, have a, a, great, uh, a great cause and start a campaign, and then next thing they've got, you know, millions of dollars and, um, and the basically CEO of a multi-million dollar company and that's a full-time job. So, you know, the fact that Support Act's all set up to administer grants and um, that, that all the support could go there was really important. And then, you know, interestingly, out of, uh, out of any funding, uh, federal funding coming through, 10 mil went to Support Act. So, I mean, I think that's number one, you know, it's number one crisis, number two recovery and um, to save lives and then to try and save some businesses. So artists have uh, places to go and uh, work uh, when when we get through all of this is so important. So um, yeah, there have been some some positives in terms of how well everyone worked together. And I've never seen anything quite like that campaign. How quickly that got up and how uh, how much media was done around that. Um, so you know, kudos to everyone involved. Yeah, it's incredible. And I should probably should say at this point that Support Act's crisis relief policy is now in effect, and we will start issuing uh, grants in the next week. Uh, we'll have like a bit of an or orderly. Q aspect to it based on um, you know people's eligibility and how serious their criteria the criteria that they're meeting. Um, so yeah, we've got a lot to get through, and also we have six months to kind of equip a, a portion of the funding. So we will be responding as quickly as we can with our small and you know scaling up staff group. Um, but just as a bit of an update where we're at with that, so that's all really positive. Um, just for just so we can we're getting towards the end of this chat. I mean, what's next for Music Victoria? Obviously, you know you're running at the moment, but you guys are playing a huge role in providing resources to artists out there who are wanting to do something creative through this period. What's on the agenda for your, your organisation more broadly over the next couple of months? Yeah, so... Um, Have you had time to think about that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> some great staff yeah. doing some thinking for you as well. <laughs> yeah, oh look, you know, we've got a really adaptable staff and um, we're all working remotely, but we're speaking to each other every morning, first thing, nine o'clock and, you know, okay, uh, we've got an issues register. We've got a matrix on what the issues for all the different sectors are, what our immediate response is, who else is supporting those sectors. And then we've got another tab for six months time. So um, very much it's been about sort of lobbying for some immediate support for the industry um, and then disseminating that support um, with all of these weekly meetings. and anyone um, can um, join up to our, our, our session. So every uh, week we're having a professional development session for musicians and then every other week we have a session called Ask Me Anything where we have experts on those panels. So that's gonna um, probably, that, that'll all keep sort of running uh, for a little bit longer, but we're, in a couple of weeks we're going to start, well, we're already starting to think about, um, you know, what the recovery might look like. Um, certainly, um, the professional development panels in uh, June, which we're planning for the Leaps and Bounds Festival run by City of Yarra, which will be streamed this year, will be around the, the, the comeback. Um, so, you know, uh, cue Rocky music here. Yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> so in terms of venues, what does that look like? That looks like when, we, when they can reopen, what are the tips, best tips that um, everyone learned from um, the social distancing? Um, because we've got to assume that um, that that will still be in place when they reopen. So with venues, we'll discuss, start discussing what that might look like. Um, with artists, we're going to start um, really focusing on um, on um, how you can how you can record at the moment. Um, as soon as you're able to jam again with your with your band and record, what are the best um, opportunities for even home recordings? Um, and then what's a good time to be releasing new music? Um, how do you get it out there? How do you make the most of um, extra support, hopefully by uh, the media? And um, what does touring look like? What does the regional tour, touring circuit look like in Victoria post this crisis? Um, we're hoping to hell that those, um, the venues are all still open, but we'll, we'll need to start again. You know, we'll need to work out which 
uh, venues are still open, how we can support them. We're, we've already written to every single councillor in Victoria, urging them to support their local uh, music communities and written a best practice guide for how they can do that. Um, but regional, the most vulnerable groups will be a real priority. Um, regional First Nations artists, um, young people, youth unemployment's a huge concern. Mm -hmm. um, and, and what concerns us is also concerning the government. So in terms of us, you know, Pre um, preparing a, uh, a proposal for what some amazing regional touring program might look like involving um, with a particular focus on um, the regions affected by the bushfire crisis and the drought. I mean, you know, there was a program called Give Me a Break that was going to go out last year to uh, help the drought affected <laughs> regions. Then it was the bushfire affected regions. And then that, that, that all forgot forgotten about while we've dealt with this bastard and then um so we can't forget about you know who's who the most vulnerable are but we're already the regional, it tough before all of this happened yeah the regional touring sector is absolutely vital and um so what we'll look at is um is what what can be needed how can we work with councils and um and regional um areas um to um get some amazing lineups together and a really big marketing spend and really encouraging people to come out um the consumer confidence is going to be a really big thing. So, you know, we'll start working out, you know, what that, um, what that might look like uh, in terms of, um, you know, the artists having opportunities to, to get out there and, um, and um, play to the public again and, uh, and share all the amazing music that they've been writing during this difficult time. Great stuff. I've got one more question for you, Patrick, before we wrap it up and let people go and learn more about Cow's Muff online. Um, what lessons do you think the music industry or what single lesson do you think the music industry can take from this whole <clears throat> isolation crisis with COVID-19? I mean, there's so many things that I feel like I've experienced for the first time and learned from just this unprecedented situation, but what's one thing that you think the music cool. industry can learn from this? <sighs> yeah, look, I, I suppose I'll, um, I'll go pretty, pretty, pretty big with this. And I think we've uh, realized how much we um, love music how much music is helping us get through um, day after day and um, some of the playlists that are being shared and some of the streaming concerts. Um, it is one of the few things we can hold on to. And um, certainly, uh, particularly countries in stage four, I mean, you, you can see, you know, what's keeping people together. There's opera singers out on balconies and, you know, the power of the voice, um, the way that music connects us is just so important. And I think that, um, that people are realizing that more than ever. And hopefully people are confident to come out and um, um, just social, social interaction with each other. Um, you know, a lot of people are living alone or you're with your families, but I think the way that music connects us, um, I think maybe people have taken that for granted. Um, I hope that, um, you know, things weren't great for musicians before this. I hope we'll have a chance to realize um, the value of music and um, we might be able to try and, you know, negotiate a better deal for artists. Um, because I think we're realising now who who is really important to society, and it's you know it's artists and doctors and and, and teachers, um, and I think you know they're some of the lowest paid jobs in society, and I really hope that something might change there about um, how much we value them, and hopefully we might be able to turn that into a better economic return. So, a bit of a broad answer then, but um, uh, I, think I think that's, that's the what, I think that's the perfect place for us to finish, Patrick. Yeah, I think if we just cling on to that and uh, it unites us and I suppose the industry, we can keep working really well together and just remind ourselves what's really important um, and we need to work together um, on a united front um, to benefit, you know, uh, the people who are really hold this whole industry together. So um, um, I'm hoping that we'll come out of that uh, with a bit uh, stronger focus and I'm hoping that um, the audience and the public and hopefully the government will um, uh, put a high value on music and um, I certainly know we're going to enjoy it uh, like like never before when we first get to uh, hear live music again. Cheers, Paddy. That's fantastic. For anyone who's uh, got all the way to the end, make sure if you're experiencing any issues with your mental health or your well-being in general, if you want to reach out, it's one eight hundred nine five nine five hundred to contact the Support Act Wellbeing Helpline. Uh, it's available twenty four hours a day, seven days a week. Once again, thanks so much to Patrick Donovan, CEO of Music Victoria, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thanks, Luke.